at the moment we are in Zhu Ming's um, in museum and he is a Taiwanese artist and one of you know the symbol of Taiwanese um, art he's, he started the idea of well basically he's a first of all he's a sculptor um, and he explored a lot of the ideas about man versus nature and man's relationship to nature so one of the things that he did that's never been done to, before it's a sculpture garden literally a whole a whole garden filled with his sculptures um, and each one of course represent a different theory that that, um, that he did and one of the, the the most important series that he did was called tai chi series and it's you know the the chinese um, martial arts and then when you know he actually went abroad he worked in new york and rome for for a few of um, what is it called? A few art residencies. And then when he came back, he bought this massive land and he wanted to build, you know, a studio for himself, you know, to work and and try to challenge himself, you know, to... Because whatever he does, he never felt that it was enough. Whatever he created, it never felt that it was enough. So he always wanted to challenge himself to create more and more and more um, and try to, you know, because art at the end of the day was, was his way of looking at what, life. Art was his religion uh, more than anything else. And then, yeah, after he bought this land, he built, you know, a very, you know, small studio for himself and then expanded it and expanded it and he built everything. He made the whole architecture around the whole thing. And then, you know, he actually donated 2,000 pieces of his art for the world to see and um, that's why he became a Taiwanese, you know, symbol as an artist because he reminded so many Taiwanese people of the beauty of their home country, of the strength of their home country and of their culture. And that's why, you know, he's extremely um, popular now and even before, he, he's the one that opened, you know, the world and the, the, the Taiwanese art, um, art world. And yeah, we're just gonna go around the garden and we'll hopefully give you a few lovely videos and I'm extremely sad that we do not know this artist from before and you know I personally didn't know him or learn learn about him in our you know contemporary books of course we did not and there's a whole wall here if you walk around it you can see how many awards he's won and how many you know people what well, that is his how many people um Oh damn, that's fine. <laughs> How many people um, actually appreciate his art? But if you look at the countries and if you look at, at the geography of where he won those um, those awards, it was not outside of uh, of Asia, and it was and that's the sad part that is not appreciated outside because it really like if if we all you know get to see this stuff so different from what we do it's i think we can hopefully what he's trying to do is show you a different philosophy of life and yeah we're gonna go around and we'll give you a video of his sculptures this is amazing the parachute ones Welcome to the world of Zhu Ming. And he did heal a, a whole like series of bar parachutes. Um, and it's the soldiers that came back from the war. This is literally a whole, a whole garden that he created. And he was the first person to ever, ever create an exhibition and a museum and a studio in a garden in the outside and you know you walk around those sculptures um, and because it's in the middle of the mountains so you you look at them and it reminds you of something but around you it's all nature it's all the sound of nature because there's nothing else around here beside nature and i think that's what he also tried to do, to show, you know, to show humans and nature relationship together. And how, you know, you can, you can separate them with your own experiences, but how you really can separate them at the end of the day. 
Juming is also an incredibly, incredibly talented sculptor. Um, and each series that he did is with, with a completely different type of material um, and with a completely different style. Um, and the material also affects his way of looking at life and, um, and his way of expressing things, the mundane as well. Um, and that was a massive reason of why he did it that way. And you know, there's also you know the idea of having um, an exhibition and a museum outside in the garden, meaning you know, and each sculpture that he does is a, from a completely different, you know, material, and and that also plays a very very big factor because it's outside. You know, we have different weathers. Every time the sculpture will change with the different different weather as well. Um, and maintaining that, you know, keeping the sculpture in a good condition with every different season that we have um, throughout the years, it's also a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And I think that's also his language of making us, you know, appreciate art more to, to, to take care of it, you know, to put love into it. Um, and yeah, I also think that's, that's, something I personally also haven't seen anywhere someone you know to be able to get into your head in that way um, and make you see the world and why we should take care of these things and why we should appreciate art um, to also you know make it a way that also nature affects it um, so take care of it you know and it's the same idea as take care of yourself Give love to yourself. What do you think? We're now going to walk through the Treasure Hill um, village and it's a village full of artists that they, you know, all the artists, they converted it to their own houses and also studios. It's the whole thing only for them, where they work, where they live, where they do everything. Um, we'll hopefully be able to interview some of them. Super, super artsy. Um, this is just from the outside. Um, and there's like each house has its own exhibition, which we will hopefully be able to get to. So we're in the artist's village, but unfortunately, a lot of the artist cities were closed. Some of them, I think, you know, they were renovating it, putting up new work. And I think we're too early and everyone is like, you know, piss off earlier, earlier. So hopefully next time we'll come back and we'll take a proper tour um, of all the studios and hopefully we'll be able to speak to a few of the artists. What can our artists ask for more than this peacefulness? Two fortune cookies. So this is the artist village. It used to be a governmental space, but then they stopped using it and they you know the Minister of Culture completely flipped it for residency for um, every single medium of art, you know, um, they have open studios, they have um, performance art, they have sculptors, um, and then, you know, every artist that lives here, um, they practice their art here, they do their art here, and then, you know, they, it's constantly on exhibit. So, yeah, I'm super excited to see what they have here. Um, 
so we're, we're in the artist's village and you know one of the installations um, is about the sea pads of every motorcycle or maybe a car and you know the photographer made you know a series of you know collection of different motor motorbikes and the, you know the holes inside them um, you know maybe people did not have the money to go and you know fix it but then the artist you know want to take it further and say you know those those holes in, in the seats, um, they could also represent the person um, and, and how torn they are inside and some of them tried to cover it, some of them didn't try to cover it. Um, and you know, I think it's a very smart and funny installation because um, the artist did not intend to make it extremely you know, painful, extremely uh, meaningful, let's say, but you know, they, they more or less tried to also go about it in a, in a more humoristic way. So I think like they, they started with you know very small holes of the motorcycles, you know, and each one is completely different, and that that could also represent the person um, and how we all of us you know have very different types of scars that we live with daily. Um, so I think yeah, it was a very smart installation, and um, and I think not everywhere we can see an installation like that because the motorcycle industry, you know, people using motorcycles. Is, is not as evident as in Taipei or in, in the Asian culture in, in general. So I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna show like a few of those um, pictures that the artist took. Some of them actually look, you know, that they are from the couch of, of um, the motorcycle, but some of them, if you just look at it and not read it, you can, your, your brain could wander to so many different places. And the artist actually, you know, um, practices their art here and is a resident, and that's why all of those motorcycles are actually parked every day near the artist village and the cool thing is that many of the artists um, in the artist village is that many of them they went abroad on exchange uh, programs some of them as I saw some of them were in Australia some of them were in Korea um, so all over the place and the the most beautiful thing that I you know um, I realized is that even though they went away, you know, even though they tried to look at different types of art, learn different types of art, the memories that they have there, the memories that, or the experiences that they've had in those different, you know, parts of the world, they somehow managed to come back and merge those two for, you know, Taiwan, for the history of Taiwan, for the nature of Taiwan. Um, so yeah, there's there's something extremely evident about the artists here in Taiwan and the the love that they have for their country and how they want to represent it um, mainly with nature. Um, so yeah, and I, I I really really appreciate that a lot. And even though it's like a massive city, massive, really big city, um, nature is extremely evident, like it's, it's extremely alive here. Wherever you walk, in the city center, on the main street, on the highway, there's so much greenery. And I think that's also one of the reasons why the artists, um, you know, they, they go back to nature within their work, within their inspiration. It's it's very I think very big part of, of their culture, which I'm trying to you know um, learn about a little bit more. So stay tuned. So you know we've been to uh, we've been in Taiwan for almost you know five days now, and all of the the art places that we went to, um, they originally well they they either were a government building that is you know it was not in use anymore or 
or it was um, an abandoned building and then you know the Ministry of Culture or a lot of you know community of artists took it and they flipped it into the art and so you know I know that Remy you know is a or a veterans a, village Sorry, yeah or, or a veteran no or a veterans village yeah. yes in, in the past you know all the veterans that came back um, they they gave them those small villages or small buildings to stay in, um, you know, after after the war and to heal from trauma and so on. And then, you know, after you know, a long time after they flipped it into the arts. Um, and, you know, so I know that you're a massive, you know, you have a massive fascination for, for abandoned buildings and for the use of space after those buildings been abandoned. So what can you tell us from what we've actually seen so far? Well, I'm really intrigued by the village we were just in and how I didn't know before that it was a veterans village, but of course I was drawn to it because of abandoned spaces. Um, my fascination with them and what I find so intriguing here is how they're utilized because in a lot of places you don't find that. Like we were talking about London. If a building isn't being used, they knock it down and they build it into something else. For sure. Um, but here it seems that these abandoned places like that village that was a veterans village and this that was an office building and then what we're going to next was an old tobacco factory that they have allowed artists to take over these spaces and to just create them into something different rather than like uh, destroy them and rebuild yeah which is so interesting you know that it would I mean would be here in, in Taiwan that it would be like that you know like not even in Lebanon do they do that there's maybe one building in the middle mm -hmm. of Lebanon where I saw one artist and all of his artwork was about destruction, about fire and destroying that was actually utilized as space. The other ones are left or because of the corruption or whatever, but it's not used that way. And I find it so beautiful that Taiwan is doing that and Taipei mm -hmm. is allowing artists to go in and to take over these spaces because it adds an extra element to them. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, knowing what these places were used for, and the history that they had to to flip it to a place that's extremely peaceful i think you know that's also by by itself is so impressive it's just really impressive like look where we are right now you know we're in the middle of the city <laughs> Yeah, and you know, in Taipei, in the middle of the city, but I like I can barely hear anything next to me other than you know than the trees or the wind or you know um, um, people maybe speaking here and there, but that's about it. And it's it's fascinating. Well, I guess we spoke a little bit early. Um, the Taipei Artist Village, um, unfortunately, they're gonna destroy the building soon because the building you know originally was hit by an earthquake and you know the government does not think it's an extremely safe building you know for people to stay in and live in and you know do such activities so yeah unfortunately um, but I hope they move it to somewhere else and they find you know another abandoned building um, and put it to use uh, yeah hopefully one day we'll come back and we'll be able to know where they moved such a beautiful place but unfortunately they, all the art studios are closed it's really 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 beautiful it's like in the city but away from the city um, yeah.